Hey there, fellow nerds and geeks, artist alley evangelists, and supporters of independent creators. Aaron Naboose here, and thanks for tuning in to the Hall H Show podcast. Back in October of 2017, I went to check out a comic creator meet and greet at Panels Comic Book Coffee Bar in Oceanside, California. Comics and coffee? Yes, please. In attendance were Terry Mayo, the writer and creator of The Wicked Righteous, Keith and Jones, creator of The Power Nice and owner of Kid Comics, Scott Lost, a former pro wrestler and creator of Second Shift, and he's also part of the Accidental Aliens Anthology, Chad Cavanaugh, creator of the comic books Rad God, The Map, and Bedlam and Trouble Town, and he's also the owner of Grunt 1B Comics, Matt Dunford, cosplayer, comic book historian, and current San Diego Comic Fest chairman, and Andrea Ducleth, an artist who is also part of the Accidental Aliens Anthology. Please enjoy my conversations with them, and if you are ever in San Diego, particularly in North County, where Oceanside is located, stop by Panels and get your comic book and coffee fix. Enjoy. Aaron here from the Hall H Show, and uh, we are at uh, Panels, a uh, comic book coffee shop here in Oceanside, and um, we got a few artists here that are doing a meet and greet. Uh, we got uh, first up, it's uh, Terry Mayo. How are you doing, Terry? I'm good. How are you doing? <laughs> um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, let's see. Well, native of Texas, but been in San Diego for the last uh, 20 some odd years. Uh, started off doing screenplays up in Hollywood, trying to get rich and famous, but didn't quite achieve that. So, so started doing comic books about uh, five years ago, web comics. Uh, then got my first one published by Alterna about half a year ago, and then ball's been rolling since then. Well, what's the comic book called? Comic book is called The Wicked Righteous. Um, number two came out uh, Wednesday, Wednesday the eighteenth of uh, October. Awesome! Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, what's uh, What's the premise behind this? Uh, the Wicked Righteous. The premise. Well, luckily you say that. <laughs> uh, we have it tagged as Stranger Things meets Mad Max. It's four teenage brothers rescue a young girl from a brutal gang of psychopaths and spark a disastrous chain of events. It takes place in uh, San Diego, California. Uh, long story short, something has happened in the world and the vast majority of adults have, have died. So that leaves the children, the, the righteous. And then it reminds me of a, like a Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> but basically, like that, but with a little bit more blood. <laughs> and um, correct me if I'm wrong. You were mentioning that these are stories that you told your kids on on car rides. Yeah. I don't know if that what kind of dad that makes me, but <laughs> but but yeah. I like I said originally from Texas. So whenever we go back driving through Texas, driving through Yuma, driving through Arizona, New Mexico. I'm always telling them stories because it's cheaper than buying books on tape. So it starts off, all of my stories start off with Once Upon a Time There Were Four Brothers. So Wicked Righteous starts off Once Upon a Time There Was Four Brothers and it takes place in San Diego. All my kids have biblical names. Uh, the four characters in here have biblical names. So just kind of a what if, my Marvel what if version of, uh, of my kid's life. <laughs> Now, now, this is a six-part series, correct? Right. Correct. Yes. And uh, I guess you're going to be working on a, on a second six-part? I, I am. Uh, nothing official has been released yet, but I have been working on issue uh, 7 through 12, and we'll see what, what happens. Yeah. Well, I mean, cause the reason I ask is because uh, the first six has four kids, and you have six kids, right? I do. So There's two more. <laughs> there, there, yeah, there's two more characters that need to be filled. <laughs> um, so... I'm always curious when I talk to other creatives and, and people who create their own comic books. Um, first of all, like, how were you when you were a kid? What, what, what was Terry like at 11? <laughs> Ooh, I guess you'd have to ask one of my seven sisters, but I, I was a hellion. I uh, talked too much, didn't listen enough. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, and I have another book coming out called Disposable Legends, and it's, it's kind of 
different uh, clones of, uh, of famous people put on TV to fight for enjoyment, that kind of thing. And it kind of always reminds me of me in my bedroom playing with my G.I. Joes, my Star Wars, my He-Men, and just kind of putting them in a big battle royale. So that was me, an overactive imagination, just creating my own worlds. And that's kind of stayed with me, apparently. <laughs> so how did you find your, your way into comic books? Like, Do you remember the first comic book that you read? I do, actually, yeah. The first comic book I read was a Marvel What If. And I, I know it came out in the 70s, but I'm not sure which one it was. I think it was uh, What If uh, Wolverine Had Killed the Hulk, vice versa, maybe. But it was I, I remember being familiar with the Marvel Universe through like older my sister's older boyfriends and whatnot, but I never really had jumped into it. So seeing this What If and seeing an actual character that I knew, like, being killed, I was like, oh my god, this is this is amazing, you can do anything in comics. So I just, so yeah, and then it picked up from there, I always enjoyed Spider-Man, always enjoyed X-Men, I've, make mine Marvel, that kind of thing. So, what other Marvel characters did you like growing up? Um... Gosh, I, I, like I said, I've always been a big X-Men fan. I, Gambit was always just that, that ladies' man that, that I never could be. <laughs> that kind of thing in Spider-Man. Um, I've always rooted for the villain for some reason, so I'm big into Doctor Doom, Venom, Carnage. It, pre pretty much any Spider-Man villain I'm, I'm all over. How do you think the Marvel movies have fared so far? Are you a big fan of them? I am. I'm a big fan of them. I've been following them. Um... I'm looking forward to Ragnarok, looking forward to um, Black Panther. The trailer for Black Panther looks amazing. I, you know, there, there hasn't been a Marvel movie that I've seen in the last couple of years that I, that I haven't been a fan of. Um, DC movies, not so much, but, <laughs> but the Marvel are great. So you mentioned the Gambit earlier. Do you think that Gambit movie will ever be made? Yeah, I, I, again, I'm torn about how Channing Tatum is going to pull that off, and I don't know. I, he's not convincing me, but <laughs> I, I, he doesn't convince me. But hey, I'm, I'll be a fan of anything that they put out. I, I guess you weren't a fan of Jupiter Rising. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> so how did you find your way into actually creating your first comic book? Um, well, like I said, I, I, I did screenplays for a little bit, sold some, but they always sat on a shelf. They never got turned into anything. So you go back to your family and you're like, yeah, I, I sold some screenplays and then nothing ever gets produced. And they're like, okay, Terry, sure. <laughs> sure. You're writing these screenplays. Um, so I, like I said, I, I've always been a comic book nerd. When my kids got old enough to start reading comic books, I was like, oh, this would be amazing. I could make something with them, kind of put it out. And there's Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so um it was kind of more of a collaborative effort with me and my kids they pushed me to do it when i didn't think that it would be something i could do but yeah so this is i, I give all the cra the praise to, to my boys for pushing me um we talked earlier before the interview and you said that you work full-time as a nurse mm -hmm. yeah. um and i had to ask you how do you find the time between working full-time as a nurse uh raising six kids and uh, creating comic books. Well, it's 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 a little it's rough. My my two older ones, my two older boys, are out of the house right now. So I have a 23 year old. He's in the military in Guam. So he's kind of raising himself now. My my second old just went to college. He went to UC uh, Santa Cruz. So he's been out of the house for a month now, which is sad but <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm dealing with that and the other ones range from three years old to 15 years old so it's 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 a lot of sacrifice missing things or taking the laptop to things it's it's a lot of late nights getting three hours of sleep sometimes it's you know it's it's there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into doing something that you love and you know and you told me an interesting story about I guess one of your sons uh, is in Guam, mm -hmm. and uh, he had happened to see somebody else reading one of your comic books. Yeah. <laughs> you want to tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, it's amazing the reach that, that the yeah, book has. I, I didn't realize how wide it was, but um, one of the comic shops in Japan carries the book, and apparently he saw the person reading it in a co in a coffee shop, took a picture, sent it to me. So it was just it was it was surreal. It was a surreal moment. What other countries is your comic book in? Um, I know it's in the UK, Ireland, Japan, 
Africa, uh, the Netherlands, um, Canada, and everywhere in America except for Alaska for some reason. It's not in Alaska. I don't know why. I don't know why it's not in Alaska, but it's not there. Um, but yeah, and and every every month I'm learning of some new place that it's that that it's reaching. I, yeah, it's just it's wild. Um, I, I always run into a bunch of uh, independent creators, and they're, they're trying to make it into, you know, sending up meetings with other publishers and trying to pitch their their ideas. Do you have any advice for for some of them that are trying to, I guess, hook up with some of the other publishers? Uh, just have a thick skin, because you're going to hear no a lot. And my personal thing that I do, I have this huge bookshelf, and all my rejection letters, which a lot of companies don't send rejection letters anymore. If you hear anything, that's that's a that's a plus, but um, whether it's yes or no, but the the no's I've gotten a couple letters like from uh, 2000 AD and some of those other companies. I save them, I put them in a book, uh, a random book on my shelf, and I just save it. If it's an email, I print it out, I save it, put it on the bookshelf, just so that one day I can be reading through this book and find this letter. And it just kind of it motivates me, kind of like the teacher in high school that says you're never going to mount anything, and how you want to like prove them wrong. So I want to prove these letters wrong that I that I do have what it takes. So uh, thick skin. Don't take no for an answer. Just keep pushing and be persistent. And how have your kids reacted to your comic books? <laughs> um, they're, I know they're proud of me. <laughs> they're, just like I was when I was 11, they make theirs Marvel. They have their favorite characters. And, and you know, at, at some point, they're going to appreciate my characters. <laughs> right now is not, right, right, right not one of them. I think it... It's hard for them to see me as being someone who has a book out on shelves, who who can go into a comic shop and see something I've made, because I'm still just dad to them. I'm just I'm just this goofus who walks out of his room in his underwear. So, yeah. So it, it hasn't hit them as much as it has hit me. <laughs> um, seeing as how you come from a screenwriting background, um, if your comic book was made into a movie, like who would want who would you want to play some of the the characters in your book? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the kid from Stranger Things and It. Uh, I forget his name. He had the glasses. He's the main kid in Stranger Things. I guess I should know his name. But uh, he's an awesome actor right now. And the Wicked Righteous is is four teenage boys. Uh, and I, he's so talented, I think he would be able to pull off uh, one of the main characters in it. Um, I really don't write my characters with an actor in mind. Usually it's somebody in my life, like a co-worker or an ex whoever with somebody in mind and I just kind of build them around that. But yeah, the Stranger Things kid, thats I can totally see him. Speaking of Stranger Things, they're going to be starting their new season soon. Yeah, yeah I'm excited about that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so going forward, are there any other projects that you can tell us about? Yeah, yeah, I've got a um, short story coming out in the IF Anthology in November. Um, this gets called Helpless. It's a little serial killer-ish, eight-page story. Um, another sh two short stories coming out the following year. Um, I have a, another six-part limited series coming out through T-Pub um, called Disposable Legends. Uh, it's supposed to be coming around January, February-ish. Um, sent the covers off to Diamond and we're waiting to hear back on scheduling for that. Uh, and then another limited series that I'm going to start pitching probably at the beginning of the next year. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's what I have so far and anything else is just not ready to announce, I guess. Yeah. I, I guess when you're ready to announce, uh, why don't you reach out to us and we'll, we'll get it on the podcast. Oh, definitely, man. Anytime. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, where can people find you online? Um, all of my stuff, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, is all at MayoTL. So just type in M-A-Y-O-T-L or Terry Mayo and I should pop up. Well, thank you for your time, Terry. Thank you. It was great. It was great meeting you. Yeah, great meeting you. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hall H Show. I am here with uh, Keith and Jones. He's no stranger to the podcast. Uh, we're at Panels uh, Comic Book and Coffee Shop here in Oceanside. And uh, Keith, and how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm here at Panels in Oceanside first time. Um, I think they've been, in, they've been around for uh, maybe a year, two months. So this is super brand new out here in Oceanside. It's a very nice place. Have your coffee, have your comic, and eat it too. <laughs> or is that drink it too? <laughs> drink it too. Well, they, they have pastries also. Pastries, I, I had I had one of their, their blueberry pies. It was pretty good. All right. 
Hey. Shout, out to, shout out to Paul H. <laughs> We're always supporting indie um, comic book artists and other artists. Um, it's, good, it's great to that's right. Great to have that, you around. That, that's, that's what we do. That's what we do. Sir. Um, <laughs> what, what's new? Uh, well, I've had issue one, two, and three of the Power Nights out for about a year now. Um, and I have a, I'm, I'm currently working on Power Nights for PK4. And I have a Kickstarter in the works that I want to um, debut later this year. I don't have an exact date, so I'm hoping you all support that. Um, this one, I really think I, I really think I stepped it up ten times on this one. Um, I think it's going to be a unique comic book. Um, I'm pushing it artistically with the with the art and the writing. Um, so if you're a fan of the series, uh, a lot of things will be a lot of the the story will be revealed and resolved. Um, the series itself goes to five, and then after that, I'll have a trade paperback. But uh, right now, I'm working on four, and I and I'm really excited about it because I think it's going to be probably the best one of the whole series. And uh, like I said, there will be Kickstarter attached to that, so I'm really hoping and counting on you guys to support that. And for those of you who don't know who Keith and Jones is, uh, he's been on the podcast a couple of times, and he's. Uh, Owner of uh, Kid Comics is a publishing company, and the and the writer creator of the Power Knights. It's a story that has been in his head since he was 11 years old. <laughs> so it's an awesome book. So uh, if you guys are out there, yeah, listen good. to the podcast. Go go check it out. Yeah. Um, so you were recently at another con um, called MechaCon. Oh, Mecha you, you want you want to talk about that one a little bit? Yeah, my second time in Detroit for MechaCon, which is headed by my Maya Crown Williams. Uh, you can find her on Facebook, either under her name, Maya Crown, or uh, MechaCon. Just look it up. It'll pop up. Um, they're based in Detroit. Uh, we did it at the downtown Detroit Library, and that re went really well. Uh, it's primarily African-American comic book artists, uh, but it's open to all. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a great venue to give people or artists who otherwise don't have, have limited resources as far as uh, displaying their work. Uh, so that went really well, had a good turnout. Um, at least I did. I know I did. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just continuing the journey of, of, of my, my personal journey of becoming a successful comic book um, artist, writer, and um, entrepreneur as far as publishing goes. So, so far, so good. Um, I don't. I really don't have much else. I don't really have anything negative to say other than um, there's times where it's challenging. Obviously, uh, this is not a. It's not an easy profession to stay in because some days you feel like no one's paying attention, but then you have days where it's like the world's open up to you and you're and you're, you're getting a lot of positive responses and it just propels you to continue on. So. So, so how how do you stay positive outside of you know your how, how do you how are you able to, to stick to the daily grind of, of creating something? Um, first of all, I love it. I think that's really the real reason I've stuck around so long. Um, secondly, through the response of readers, you know, if I I've, I've been doing it for three years now, a little over three years, so I would. I would have stopped a long time ago if I didn't have any type of response. Like if I sat here and no one showed up and no one ever bought my books, then obviously I'd be in a different headspace, you know, be contemplating my life. <laughs> uh, but fortunately for me, uh, it seems to be trending in the right direction. And uh, even though the real world intervenes, like uh, recently, like recently I just had surgery on on my mouth because I had a tooth infection so and I continue to ha work on issue four through that pain but I'm not one to post that on social media like I'm when I'm going through stuff like physical pain or I'm sick or a family member passes away or you know financial issues and stuff of that nature I and mean, we all go through it but I try not to burden people with those stories and just keep it positive and keep them focused on the art and the book because that's what I'm doing it for like I want I know everyone has their daily grind and they need some type of escape and I want to provide that that escape for them to my, to my art. speaking of stories let's go back to the power nights um, the first few issues dealt with uh, the introduction of the brothers mm -hmm. and then now you got uh, the, the big bad in there in the mix um, what's gonna are there any things you could tease us with for uh, issue f issue four Issue, issue four is actually is um, right now it's called uh, the Power Nights Four Formation. 
because this is when about giving away spoilers this is when they really coalesce into a unified they have a unified purpose they come together basically as a team um, on the surface the Power Knights look like you know superheroes but it's, I think it's more of a science fiction story that you know, because since they come from other worlds, you you know, you think they're wearing costume, but they're really wearing that natural garb. So it's not technic to me it's not technically a superhero story. It's just it's just science fiction. Um, but since they're on Earth, you know, they can be confused as superheroes. And they themselves don't think of themselves as heroes. They're just in a s they're just they're in a situation where one of them feels that if you have the power to make your own peace in the world, why not do it? Like if you had the power of Superman, why not force the world, to, force mankind to be peaceful, right? Because you have power to do that. Like you, but really do, but really like, like do the, you like have the, that like power? the like the quest for peace when you yeah. <laughs> yeah do you really have that power? Because can you really force someone to do right? Can you really force someone to like you? Can you know that's what this story is about. It's like some people believe you can force their philosophy on others because they have the, the means to do so whereas others feel that everyone should have a choice to live their own to choose their own path in life whether that's good or bad what's important is having li the liberty to do it that option those options you know what I mean and so that's really what the story of the Power Knights is about they have they're, they're, they're alien warriors from another world now on earth with the option to either take earth through force or live in harmony with mankind and that's where the conflict begins and this there's two boys these two humans this boy this the two brothers the young brother and the older brother by circumstance and by accident get caught up in this mix and their relationship is turned upside down because of it so they're questioning their love their, the love between the two brothers is, is tested also because now they're um how do i say they're they're their natural life their normal life is is altered and, and and enhanced by having this encounter with these aliens you know what i mean because they were having problems before that happened <laughs> and now and now add this into the mix so it, it, it amplifies everything plus their father's passed through through cancer they lost their father through cancer so the older brother was was burdened with the with being the being the father to his younger brother, mm -hmm. but he gets scarred in the process of meeting these aliens. So he's kind of spinned off into his own personal rage, um, and dealing with this newfound power, but at the same time not necessarily knowing what to do with it. Especially with 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 Candle being the youngest one, and he he lose, he's sort of lost his older brother, his father figure for for a little bit there. Right, and that's Can Candle being the youngest one. This is. Hi, how are you? This is Candle, and matter of fact, they should see this scene here. This is where everything changes. If you can see that, his older brother find um, his older brother warns him of what he saw, and that basically changes their entire world. Before giving you guys spoilers, so the younger brother, the two brothers lost their father, but now the younger brother has lost his old. He hasn't lost his older brother, but his older brother's life has been changed to the point where it's like he could lose him. So Candle's really concerned about making his world whole again and getting things back to normal. Whereas the older brother is like, I have power now myself through this accident or through this attack on me. And what am I going to do with this power, you know? So it's like, I'm trying not to give you guys spoilers. So if it sounds a little convoluted, I'm sorry. It's just, <laughs> just try to avoid ruining the story for you. But, um, but basically that's what's going on, yeah. Um, have you watched the the recent Voltron? Oh yeah, I love it. Uh, Princess Allura al almost reminds me of uh, Princess Raxi. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, that's true. Yeah, because because Princess Raxi in my story, my princess has her father basically set everything into motion through his actions, and um, basically he is. Uh, I don't want to know. I could say he's he's power hungry, but at the same time, his power hunger comes from a paranoia of of just wanting to like control his own destiny. And he had the knights brought together just to do under under a mind control to do just that to conquer worlds for me, you know. And so 
the princess that's being her father she's conflicted because she didn't you know she didn't share those thoughts but that is her father and now she's tasked with the burden of kind of like luke skywalker like finding out that darth vader is his father's like dang yoda wants me to take care of him but at the same time that's my dad you know so <laughs> no, that's not true. Yeah, it's true, bro. <laughs> so, um, so what's what's next for for Keith and what what other projects are you working on besides Power Nights? Oh, good question. Um, what am I? What else am I working on? Um, are you still teaching that class at Platt? Uh, not currently. So not until they get another class, another set of students for me. So. You were, uh, it was about comic book creation. Uh, yes. Okay. I did it for eight weeks. My first time being a, uh, a college professor. You want to maybe uh, tell us about that experience a little bit? Um, sure. Um, it was interesting. It was really fun. Um, at first, it was um, nerve-wracking. I never did it, so I wasn't sure what to expect out of myself or the class. <laughs> Um, but about the third day, I got into the groove of it, started to feel a little more natural for me. Um, and we covered the gamut from the technical side of making comics to the history of comics, from, uh, from the days of um, the creation of Superman to Jack Kirby to Will Eisner, we touched on those things slightly. Because I felt like the students should have some type of real comic book history foundation so they so if you don't have a foundation it's hard to move the move the genre forward or the art form forward because you're just regurgitating what's already there but if you have a foundation then you can take it from there and move on and take those elements to the next natural evolution you know of the art um if that makes any sense yes. um but i had a good time the students at least the feedback was like they really enjoyed it they learned a lot um and I'm, I'm pleased to do it again if they ask me to. That's, it's always good sort of connecting with, with the next generation of, of creators. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, so speaking of, of the future, uh, what's next for Keithan? Ooh, I have stories floating around in my head. Some of the stuff I've jotted down at home, I have concepts and things floating around. I'm not really ready to speak on it because they're still fragmented. Uh, but it probably won't be superhero traditional based stuff it'll probably be a little more on the wild side a little, little more funky um, but the power nights that's a childhood dream of mine that's a childhood thing I created and it's something I just needed to get out of my system and I thought it especially starting kid being a, I'm, I'm my own publisher and I wanted the power nights to be the first book under the banner to come out because there's a person I have a personal connection to it and um, and I just I generally think it's a great story I really, I really like the characters I think people if they really sat down and read the book they're gonna they'll get into it and they'll see what I see and um yeah, that's all, you know, and as far as the future goes, I just want to take the company, I just want to be a, uh, be right there alongside Marvel and DC and, and Image, you know. Uh, we addressed this in a past podcast, but why is it important, or why was it important to you to start your own publishing company? <laughs> to greenlight my own projects, to greenlight my own vision, because not everyone can see, not, not everyone's going to see what you see. You know, some people may think that what you think is a good idea, um, there might be 10 other people who think it's a bad idea. And if those 10 other people, if one of those other people has the power to kill your idea, then that, you know, that sucks, you know. So why not just give myself the power to greenlight my own project? You know, if I believe it in enough, why not? You know? um, plus, it allows me, when I get to a, a financial situation where I can start... Um, hiring other artists to in, to produce books under the banner that's the ultimate goal because i don't envision myself doing this forever i want to sit back and let a, the younger generation have a shot that they wouldn't necessarily get at a marvel or dc or even image you want to talk about the other books that are under the uh, the kid comics umbrella oh yeah so there's currently there's three other creators under kid um chris ward who helps co-write the power knights he created a character called vegas baby this is an adult comic um he has a kickstarter coming out later this year also 
Um, there's Dragonfly by William Tenner, Michael William Tenner. He's up to issue four. Uh, if you go to the kids' site, if you go to the kids' site, you'll see all of these books available for sale currently, like right now. Um, there's Dragonfly. He's like it's like a alien espionage spy story. Um, a lot of if you're into like conspiracy theories about aliens and Area 51 and all this stuff, this is your book. Uh, then there's my book, of course, The Power Knights. That's Princess Roxy right there. Uh, and then there's Purge. Purge is Roosevelt Pitt's book. Um, Purge actually was a very popular book back in the, back in the early 90s. He sold like over a million copies. And so he's reintroducing the character to the modern audience. And he's currently has issue one out. He's working on issue two. And uh, that's about it. Like, if you want further details, just go to kid-comics.com. You can read the synopsis. You can look at some of the character artwork and some of the actual pages from the book. Um, you can also buy from, yeah, you can buy the book from there. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I think the prices are reasonable. We include the shipping costs. I think, I think we only charge it. I know I only charge a dollar for shipping, so... You can either go to McDonald's and get yourself a, Mac, a number one and pay like $8, or you can buy one of our books and have it forever, right? That's right. Uh, so um, where can people find you on social media? I'm on Twitter. I am KJ Kidcom or Kidcom KJ on Twitter. I am on uh, face, Kid Comics Online Facebook, Kid Comics Online. Um, or you can just look up my, uh, look up Keith and Jones on Facebook. I'm there also. Uh, I'm on. Um, did I say Twitter yet? I did. I did, did Twitter. Uh, oh, Instagram. Instagram. Instagram is KJ Kidcom, right? Instagram is KJ Kidcom. I'm not good at this. KJ Kidcom. Twitter is Kid Comics KJ. <laughs> Kid Comics, KJ. KJ Kid Comics. KJ Kid Comics, yeah. KJ Kid Comics. Put in Kid Comics. Keith, and you'll find me. Cool. Well, thank you for your time, Keith. Thank you. You guys, support Indie Comics. We need you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. We're back at a panels, coffee shop, and comic book store here in Oceanside, California. And uh, we're with uh, Scott Lost. How are you doing, Scott? I'm very well. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, what are you working on here? I saw you drawing earlier. So I'm working on a, uh, Being a, fantastic for me, a, a, a Planet of the Apes piece stuff. with uh, Bad Ape and Caesar. And uh, yeah, it's fun to do. Something, something to keep me busy while we're here uh, uh, shilling our books to the public. So yeah, just something fun to do. I like to draw and talk and uh, yeah. Speaking I'm, trying of it, I'm trying to put it down while I'm talking to you. So. Speaking of shilling books, uh, why don't you tell us about your book, Second Shift? So we have a couple of books here. So The Second Shift is a story about minimum wage superheroes, people with normal nine to fives like you and I would have, as opposed to uh, a Clark Kent or a Peter Parker who have amazing jobs. Uh, not, not a large amount of the public can have jobs like that. So my characters have normal nine to fives. And then I also have the Accidental Aliens Anthology. This is a 2017 anthology, and uh, we're going to have one for 2018 as well. But uh, this is a series of short stories put on by my art group, The Accidental Aliens. So every year we're going to be uh, having a new anthology out and the second shift will actually fall under the Accidental Aliens banner uh, starting with issue 7. Nice. Yeah, I enjoyed The Accidental Aliens. That was, that was pretty cool. Well, All right. yeah. thank, you. thank you, thank you. I heard you talking earlier and you mentioned that you used to be a wrestler. Yes. I found that pretty interesting. You want to tell us a little about that? <laughs> yeah, so I was a pro wrestler on the independent scene for 10 years. Uh, me and my writer actually, uh, we were both wrestlers. I actually co-founded uh, Pro Wrestling Gorilla. I was one of the original, uh, one of the this PWG Six is what they called us. So I was uh, one of the founders for that, and I've wrestled in uh, Southern California, on the East Coast, pretty much all around the world, uh, Japan, uh, Europe. So uh, yeah, that was fun. It was a good time. So how did you find your way into comic books? I mean, were you always into comic books uh, as a kid? Yeah, 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 definitely. I. I actually trained myself when I was a kid to draw comic books. It, it was what I wanted to do with my life, my entire life, except for uh, my late teens. I started, like, wrestling was really popular in the late 90s. And uh, so, I, but I had been watching it since I was a kid. And so I started training to be a pro wrestler and then I wrestled for 10 years. So I put, actually put my comic book aspirations on hold. So, um, uh, yeah, but, you know, I 
at the tail end of my wrestling career, I was getting back into comics and wanting to draw comics. And so it was an easy transition to get away from pro wrestling and to go back, to, go back into comic books. What was your signature move as a wrestler? I had a bunch. Um, I I created a lot. Like much, I'm a creative person. I like creating things, so I used to create uh, wrestling moves. But my finisher back in the day was uh, a big fat kill, which was a it's like a spinning hook kick to the face, and uh, so it's like a you know it's not not quite the super kick, but it's it's a spinning hook kick. So that was and uh, another one was the Superman spear. That was something I was known for, which is uh, like I would basically jump and fly from the middle of the ring into the corner where my opponent was. Like, like into their midsection. Is, so. is there a YouTube video that we can watch? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you type in Scott Lost Pro Wrestling, a ton of stuff will pop up. Um, there's uh, fans have made tons of videos of me, so there's there's a lot. I guess we can uh, shift back to your comic book. Um, second shift. Second. Sh yeah, I was, I, was trying to, I was trying to work it in there. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was there. You were almost there. You were there. <laughs> um, how did you come up with the idea for it? Um, okay, so I created these characters when I was in seventh grade. So when I was younger, initially they weren't they weren't what they are now. So as as the years have gone gone on, as as I've grown and matured, so have they they've changed. Like they're you know they're in their uh, early twenties. So uh, but when I originally created them, I would say like they were like I like, like I think actually around that same age. Now that I think about it, because I was a X Men fan growing up, and so a lot of them were X Men inspired initially, and then as the years went on, they just kept changing and uh, becoming different things and and different types of people and more well rounded. So uh, uh, yeah, so I've I've had them forever, and as like I said, as I've grown, they've grown, and uh, the main character, his jobs usually fall on what whatever my job was like. Uh, the main character works at Fish World, which is uh, my first job was Sea World. So that's so his, um, so that's him right there, and it's very reminiscent of the the colors and the uh, uniforms back then. So, um, but I made sure to tweak the logo, make sure it's its own thing, and uh, yeah. So uh, everyone has just different jobs, but he was he was one that more followed. Um, my my job paths, um, but they're all different parts of my personality. So where uh, he's the leader, um, he's this guy um, Eddie. He works at a comic book store. You don't make tons of money working at a comic book store, but he loves it. Um, sometimes he gets paid in comic books. Um, Sarah is his older sister, so he's he's kind of my youth, and uh, you know, uh, and she's she's. She's very strict because she's the older sister of Eddie. They're both Filipino. I'm Filipino, and um, uh, Anne here is a college. Student. Mabuhay. <laughs> and uh, Anne here is a college student, and she doesn't have a job, so um, that's kind of like she's she's my intellect. So they're just different parts of my personality, um, and it's makes for easy writing. So um, even though I have a writer, uh, uh, we talk a lot, and he knows he knows exactly who they are as as people and uh anytime something's off it's easy for me to identify because it's like well that part of my personal life would never do something like that but then there's parts of it that's like okay like we have to kind of steer away from that a little bit to make them more individual and and you know seem like one person yeah it seems like a lot of creators that i've been talking to recently um they talk about their collaborations with you know other people and how they found like their creative team yeah. how did you find like your your collaborators oh my writer is a wrestler so yeah so we we liked a lot of the same things uh we would see each other at shows all the time and uh, we talk about comics bruce lee shoes basketball and so we had all this stuff in common and and he would always send me scripts of his his comics he was like hey i want you to read this and uh, he always wanted me to draw his books, and I'm, a lot of his stuff revolved around war and stuff like that, and, and that's not really my jam. So I was just like, hey man, why don't you try writing my story? And so I gave him uh, like kind of a scene, I gave him character traits of everybody, their personalities, what things that they aspire to be, you know, what, what I see them being in the future. And uh, I was like, put him in a restaurant and write that scene. Let me hear that conversation, what that sounds like. And it was great to get that back and read a, a conversation conversation from characters that have been in my head for years and just to read a story that I I didn't make up it's like wow that's them that that's that's who they are and so just to have that initial shock of like whoa uh, what like this this exists and and it just felt good to, to read something I'd never uh, thought of myself so what's next for you what, do you, what else do you have in, uh, in the works 
Uh, the second shift is ongoing. It's ongoing series. I will probably draw that until the day I die or my hands don't work anymore. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I'm actually finishing up the seventh issue of the second shift. I just need to light box and ink the last page and draw the cover. And then it's completely done. And then, well, the, the, my part of it is done. And then I'll be having it color flat and colored. And then hopefully it'll be out by uh, December. And then while all this is going on, I'll be working back on The Wanderers of Melisanda, which is the uh, anthology story that I do. Uh, so I started the first part in the 2017 anthology and in 2018 will be the next, next installment. Um, going forward, like, where do you see the, I guess, the space of, like, independent creators going? You know, I think, I think as time has gone by, independent creating has, has just increased more and more. So, um, where I think a lot of people think that, you know, comic books and stuff like that were going to die, I feel like the independent creator is, you know, very much very much alive like there's so many of us i mean a lot of us didn't even know each other like we didn't necessarily know each other like i just met chad i think a month ago and then so now we're doing another event together and it's, it's pretty cool that um you know just local creators and creators all around they could put out their own books their own stories and have it exist without having to go through a big company to get it out um do you have any any pieces of advice that you can give to somebody who's thinking about starting their own uh, project get it done uh, don't I, I know so many people that talk about making comics but don't make comics oh I really want to do that oh I'm gonna get started or you know it, it's always about them uh, wanting to do it but never actually doing it so at the end of the day you have to sit there and you have to put in the work we were all we're actually all talking about uh, uh, putting in the work in these books um, how, how much time and effort it is you know it, it is drawing and it is fun and I do love doing it, but at the end of the day, it's still work. Like, I think each page of my comic roughly takes me, well, lately it's been like 8 to 14 hours. So it could be a long period of time. And, and most of us as independent creators have, have a, jobs. So like my character is the second shift. The drawing comics is my second shift. I have two full-time jobs. I have, I have my normal nine to five job and I have the second shift. And in all honesty, I probably put more time into the second shift than I do my, my day job. So, yeah. So yeah, put in the work, put in the work. That's, that's my number one uh, to you guys as a, you know, you know, inspiring creators, you, you need to put in the work, you need to be willing to sacrifice your time, you know, just to have the idea of it isn't enough. You actually need to, you know, not go out that night and not hang out with your friends certain nights. You, you can always make time for it, but at the same time, there needs to be blocks of time where you're actually putting in the work on the book. I think there's a uh, person by the name of Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't know if you're familiar with Gary. He has a, 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 a saying that he, that he says, he says, uh, eat crap for like a year and eat caviar for the rest of your life or something like that so all right all right that's a, that's interesting um i guess i guess that's something along the lines like uh, teach a man to fish right i guess that's the same concept as opposed to you giving someone something and then uh you know instant gratification you teach them how to do it and then they can do it for the rest of their lives. I don't know. Maybe, maybe something like that. Yeah, it definitely has to deal with, with uh, putting in the work. And like you said, you know, deciding not to go out at night, you know, cl clubbing, but actually honing your craft and, and putting in the work to get yeah. better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you definitely, the struggle, the struggle is real uh, initially. And then, you know, the hope is it will pay off, you know, um, doing independent creating. Like maybe it'll get picked up by a company that allows you to retain your rights and, and work on that full time so you're no longer longer, you know, eating the crap, as that guy said. So <laughs> so what do you do for fun when you're not uh, working on second shift? Ooh, that's a good... Oh, I play basketball. Um, not not well. <laughs> well enough. But that's what I do. I, like, I love I love basketball and I love comics and those kind of... Those are my things. That's, that's what takes up all my time. So even when I'm not working on my book necessarily, I am drawing. Like, I love drawing. Like, I'm working on Planet of the Apes right now just because it's, it's something to do. It's fun. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, drawing, as much as it is work, it's, it's a blast for me. I, I love every minute of it. So, what are the comic books that you're reading? Right now, I am reading Invincible. I just finished a volume... Uh, yeah, was it th the latest hardcover the latest ultimate edition that's 
that's the one I just finished. I can't remember. I think it's 13. It might be 13. So um, I love Ryan Otley's work. Uh, the way he destroys people's faces is amazing. <laughs> like, like just the way he breaks pages down as well. His storytelling is really strong, and I love it. Um, I'm trying to think else. What else? Saga, of course. Saga is a constant. Uh, East of West and uh, Black Science. I I read a lot of Rick Remender. I love Rick Remender. He's he's probably my like between him and Robert Kirkman. Those are my two favorite writers, um, just for different types types of stories. I think Black Science is something that I I have, but I haven't had a chance to to, to read yet. Oh yeah, get it, get into Black Science and uh, Deadly Class. Deadly Class is fantastic. There's there's a part where you feel like, I don't know where this is going. Cause it gets like, there's like a little lull and then out of nowhere it gets insane. You're like, oh my God, uh, like this, this book's so good. So yeah, if, if you have a chance, check out Deadly Class and uh, Black Science, those are real strong, real strong. Thanks for sharing those uh, comic books. Uh, where can people find you online? You can go to accidentalaliens.com. You will find, well, right now we're under construction, but soon we will have uh, our shop up so you can pick up the Accidental Alien, Alien books uh, as well as The Second Shift. And um, the other book is Unstoppable Cherub by Travis Revis. So he has issue one. This is issue zero, which I did the cover for. It is a flip book for uh, issue six of The Second Shift. So check out that site, uh, accidentalaliens.com, and you can pick up all of the Accidental Alien books there. Cool. Well, thanks for your time, Scott. It was good uh, hanging out with you again. And uh, I guess once you... Have any future projects? Just let us know, and we'll get you on the podcast. All right, we are at uh, Panels Comic Book and Coffee Shop here in Oceanside, California, for a little uh, artist meet and greet. Uh, we got a bunch of artists here, uh, including Chad Cavanaugh of Grunt One B Comics. <laughs> Thanks for being on the Hall H Show, uh, Chad. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, I guess why don't you tell us about uh, your uh, origin story? A little bit. Uh, how did you find your way to comic books, and what were you into when you were a kid? I was into Star Wars when I was a kid. I loved Star Wars. I still do to this day. However, most of my comic book consumption was more Mad and Cracked magazine. I loved the satire. Uh, it was a lot of fun. A lot of Sergio Aragones. And oh, it's fantastic, yeah. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> where do we go? Oh, so... Uh, I grew up in a very small town. I was the youngest of four. I was left out a lot, so my imagination took over, and I started drawing all the time. I started creating my own little worlds, and it was a lot of fun. By the time I was in high school, I'd made my own like little comic book. Uh, it was more of like a um, like comic strip type comic book. Um, but I've always loved to draw. I've always loved to write. Uh, but it wasn't until about uh, four years ago that I started doing my own comic books. Um, uh, I call myself Grunt 1B Comics because I'm a veteran of the United States Army Infantry. We're Thank grunts. you for your service. Thank you. But uh, we, were, we were grunts, and so I, I used that name. And then uh, um, I've got currently four different series that I've been doing. Uh, there's a, my first series I ever put out was called The Map, and it's a, like a post-apocalypse set in the northern New Mexico desert, post-global nuclear war. There are no zombies. Uh, the monsters in my book are the human survivors. I just recently put out the... Tenth and final issue of the series. Oh, is that right? And uh, I'll be getting the second volume of it out. So volume one contains issues one through five. Volume two will be uh, six through ten to round out the series. I also just completed another series, the Viking era series called Rad God. And this is the complete book here. Just put it out yesterday. Um, Rad God was a book that I came up with a couple years ago. A guy who was my army roommate, we were both sentinels at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and Arlington National Cemetery together. He passed away on the 1st of September in 2015. And he was just a giant Viking of a man. So uh, I wanted to create something to kind of honor him and, and tribute. And originally it was just a design I wanted to make that all of uh, our, a lot of our other army brothers wanted to do as a tattoo. And when I created it, I was like, oh, I should create a book out of this. So I decided to make a four-part series, and I did, and I just completed that, and that's Rad God. And then I have a uh, crime noir series, kind of a uh, John Wick meets Sin City meets The Punisher called Bedlam and Trouble Town. And I also have a, uh, my new series this year is a, uh, a supernatural western. It's kind of a Deadpool meets the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it's called Dead Oro Live. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait to check those out. 
Thank you. Um, well, let's kind of go back to Rad God because uh, before interviewing today, you had mentioned one of the characters that uh, you developed there uh, is based off of somebody. Do um, you want to tell us a little bit about that story? Absolutely. I was at Phoenix Comic Con in 2016, and uh, uh, I met a man and his son. And, and his son's name is Thor. They legally changed his name to Thor. Thor is a fantastic person. Um, and I did a sketch cover of him as Thor on a Thor sketch cover. And um, after the convention ended, I became friends with uh, him and his father. And uh, I speak to him on the phone about once a month. <clears throat> and one day his dad's talking to me. And uh, he's like, yeah, Thor really wants to be a comic book hero. And, and I said, you know... Uh, I think I have something, I, I have a way to integrate him into uh, the Rad God series. And so that's how we created the character Half Thor, um, somewhat inspired by my friend Thor. And uh, it was great to introduce a character into the comic book universe who is a, a member of the Down Syndrome community. So he's Half Thor, and this is him here, if you can see this. This mighty little warrior right there with the huge hammer. That is the character Half Thor, and uh, he shows up in <clears throat> he he shows up in issue two and continues on through the end of the story. Um, how, what you said you were a musician uh, uh, prior to our interview. Um, can you sort of elaborate on the transition between a musician to becoming a comic book creator, and why did you do it in the first place? Why was I a musician in the first place? Oh, what, what did you What did you make the transition from uh, becoming a musician to a comic book creator? Uh, I had a lot of fun doing music. I was a singer songwriter. I still have two albums on iTunes under the name Chad Cavanaugh. Um, but with music, for a while uh, you're very popular and people like you, and then at some point, people just stop liking you, and you have to kind of take an objective look at what you're doing. And uh, being a married man with three daughters at home who were all very young at the time. I was uh, going out, you know, three to five nights a week to still try to pursue music, and it just wasn't really happening anymore. And I was leaving my wife alone with these uh, these girls, um, and it just it wasn't good for uh, wasn't good for our relationship or for our family because the family should be together, especially at night. And so I I decided, you know what, I'm not going to do music anymore. It was fun, I enjoyed it, but uh, my family's more important to me. And so I stopped doing music and uh, started making comic books. And making comic books, I don't go anywhere to do it, I stay at home. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so that was my transition. I put out my first book, uh, it was The Map Number One, came out in April of 2014. Um, and since then I've put out uh, 23 self-published uh, books. Uh, that's incredible. <laughs> I have I have uh, aspirations to create my own comic book sometime in the near future. So that's 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 pretty good. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm inspired by your story. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, um, uh, the reason I'm I'm able to make comic books today is uh, because my wife goes to work every day. You know, and uh, so I'm fortunate that that she she's a good provider you know so it allows me the opportunity to be at home take care of the kids handle all the stuff at the house and make comic books uh you know instead of sitting around watching dvds all day i decided hey i'm gonna make something as well i'm gonna build my own comic book universe and uh i'm fortunate that i have the ability to do that it seems like people who are creative whether it be music or art it seems like they are they have the potential to be creative in other other ways as well so, uh, like, I'm a graph designer by trade, but I'm, I'm, I'm finding that I'm, I'm getting better at, at writing. So, interesting enough. Well, that'll be a good mix, you know. If the, the more you like what you're writing, you can do the design for it, too. So that, that allows you to keep everything in-house. I had a lot of fun being a singer-songwriter. I viewed songs as miniature movies. Uh, like, how do you capture somebody within three to four minutes, you know, and keep them and uh, give them uh, just a story that just they can really wrap themselves around. And with comic books, I like having a story arc over a period of issues, but I also like trying the challenge of writing a single issue that within that issue, you kind of have something that's, that's presented and somewhat of a, re a resolution towards the end, but not enough. You know, there's still a cliffhanger, you know, and carry that on to the next one. That's, that's kind of a fun challenge as well. So, um, I don't know, maybe the two correlate, but uh, I agree, and I enjoy it. I also started writing a novel. Um, it's not a graphic novel at all. Uh, like I said before, I've got three daughters. I love having, uh, 
good female characters, strong female characters in my books. And so the uh, the novel that I started writing is kind of a Harry Potter meets 007 meets Indiana Jones, but the lead character is a 15-year-old girl. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I'm pretty deep into it, but uh, I, I'm really enjoying writing that as well. It's kind of a, a nice uh, departure from comics. With comic books, um, every panel is valuable real estate, so there's only so many words you can put on there. You really have to show everything uh, with your artwork. And with writing a novel, man, you can just use all the words you want and really get uh, descriptive with everything, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, how long have you been thinking about that novel, like uh, the, the initial ideas and and when do you think it'll it'll come out? The idea of the novel hit, uh, hit me. My wife and I were uh, we had visited uh, Harry Potter World and Universal, and an idea that I shared with her came to me. I'm like, what if this was really what was going on in Harry Potter kind of thing, like an alternate universe theory of sorts? And that spawned the idea for the book. It's morphed from there, um, but I just started writing it outright that everybody has their own process mine is i get an idea and i just start making it um and so i'm about 21 chapters into the book so far as far as the time frame i i really have no time frame for it to be out i want to get uh, the initial draft done and then add subtract whatever i need to to make it the best possible product you, you mentioned you mentioned process um for our audience out there who are thinking about making their own comic books do you think you can maybe briefly tell us about your process when you're creating a comic book? Yeah, sure. You know, like I tell people all the time, and I've spoken at universities and high schools and with different groups, if you want to make a comic book, go make a comic book. Don't wait for permission. Don't wait for someone to sit around and be like, okay, now you can do it. Get an idea, and you can go about any way of, of going about making the comic book is your process is okay. There's not a... I don't think there's a wrong way to do it. As long as you are drawing something every day, writing it every day, and you end up with something, you end up with a product, the process is fine. And you'll, you'll fine tune it from there. Uh, my process in general is the idea comes to me, I write down a synopsis of the entire thing, um, I figure out how I want it to separate it into issues, and I do that, and then I, I, then I begin drawing it. And being the fact that um, I'm self-published, I have the... Um, I have the freedom to change whatever I want at any point in time. Uh, with the map, this book here had a completely different ending from what what it what it has, and the ending that I came up with, that I that I went with, I came up with two weeks before I finished it. Yeah, this is a book I've been working on since 2013, and two weeks before I finished it, you know, about so about a month ago, the idea of how it's going to end came to me, and. It was it was kind of world changing. It was like one of those epiphanies. I, I'm sitting there. I remember what we were doing. My wife and I are sitting there, and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, this is how it's gonna be." I told her, "I'm like, this is how it's gonna end." I didn't tell her how it's gonna end. She's like, "Why don't you tell me?" I'm like, "Cause you have to read it. I want I want to see your reaction when you read it." I said, "It's gonna be beautiful. It's probably gonna make you cry." It made me cry when I finished it. I sat there and I stared at. It. I'm like, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe I created this. This is so cool." And so now, when when uh, when people have been reading it, I I say, "Please, just." I want to know your reaction. Uh, and I've had people uh, that have messaged me and be like, I can't believe you're going to try to make me cry when I'm at work. And I'm like, yes, that was the whole point. So uh, I, I love the story. You know, it was, it was, and the way it ended, I'm very proud of, oh, I just got a cramp in my leg. Oh, oh that's much better. Sorry. Got a Charlie horse. <laughs> yeah, I had surgery on my spine almost a year ago. I was in a wheelchair a year ago at this time. I was suffering from crippling nerve pain, and I went for a period of about two months where I didn't sleep, but I was eventually able to get spine surgery, and I was able to walk that night. Uh, recovery's been fun, although uh, it makes it very hard for me to sit for any, any long period of time. So making comics becomes a, a fun challenge because you've got to sit at the drawing board for a long time. So what I've what I've done is I'll draw for two three hours at a time and then get up and have to walk around or do whatever. I like really absorb it. But yeah, every once in a while something like that happens. I get a nice little Charlie horse in the leg. <laughs> I wonder if you know you know how people are using those stand up desks. I wonder how how would the, that would be for for art, artists. No, I, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> like. That's not Stand, I wouldn't want to do a stand-up desk. I have a nice little like cushion for my seat. They, they make these great cushions where there's no pressure on the spine. It's not a hemorrhoid donut. 
cool. I took our history. You know, that wasn't my issue. But uh, it, it looks kind of like it's just one with like a little, a little cutout where you would normally sit because it takes away all the compression on your spine. But yeah, during that time, I got three books done. Yeah, because I want. I knew. I had hope. I said, you know, one day I think I'm gonna be better. And I think that when I am better, I want to look back and be able to tell a story like, yeah, you know, even though I was in pain in a wheelchair, I still finished three books. It kind of reminds me of, uh, remember that, that movie about Bruce Lee when he got hurt and then he wrote his book? No, is that where he talks about becoming water? Uh, it Be water? Well, no, no, that was that was, that was, a, that, was that video that they showed, like that black and white video when he was being interviewed. But uh, in that Bruce Lee movie back in the day uh, with, uh, I think, Jason Scott Lee, um, they showed a, a part in there where he got hurt and he couldn't, he was kind of immobile. Okay. And that's when he started writing, uh, I guess, his Tao Jeet Kune Do. Oh. So, well, that kind of reminds me of what you're talking about. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I asked Keith in this earlier and um, you, you sort of touched on it, but um, seeing as how you're a, a independent self publisher, uh, would you ever want to go? work for one of the big twos or Image or any other publishers? Do you want to stay self, uh, self, as a self-publisher? Uh, no, there, there's, there's pros and cons for everything. Um, I would stay away from DC and Marvel. Not that there's anything wrong with them. They're fantastic, but I like to own my intellectual property. You know, That's just me personally. I've, I've created this. I'm going to enjoy all the benefits from it. Um, uh, being picked up by an Image Comics or, or one of the other um, publishers that handle creator-owned would be fantastic. It would be really awesome to be able to be picked up to have that ability to print large numbers to get into diamond uh, to get it distributed worldwide that way I, I mean I handle um, uh, I, I handle every single order for my books I do everything online and uh, you know I, I get orders from around the world um, and I enjoy doing that. I enjoy being able to sign the books to the individuals that are that are buying them from me. And I appreciate their support. But uh, it would be really cool to not have to worry about, you know, getting more of these printed or getting more of those printed or how are they going to get distributed. It would be be cool to have, and that that'd be a huge benefit. You know, it would just reach a broader audience faster. But uh, I I don't know. I I like doing the work. I do pretty good multitasking. So. It seems like, you know, we talked about it uh, earlier today, but, you know, the publishers can take care of the marketing, you can take care of the creating, um, but it seems like you, uh, you know, being, uh, at least in your case, it seems like you have a good rapport with your, your fans and your audience, and you've built it up through social media. Oh, they're fantastic. Um, they call them the Blamily. So in, uh, in the first issue of the map, it was a panel that was just just a big blam on there. Looks like this. So uh, one day I'll show the pencils. There it is, right there. I'll post up the pencils. And then blam. Anyway, um, made T-shirts, stickers, and uh, so they they would start to post pictures of themselves in the T-shirts or with the books and hashtagging themselves the blamily. And it's cool because I mean that's four continents now, and it's all through social media. It's never been with the help of any professional marketing company at all. And, uh, and I, I love them. You know, I know that every time I put out a book, they're going to get online and order it, and they're going to talk about it. And uh, I enjoy interacting with them. It's a lot of fun for me. Um, that's why it's fun for me to be able to get out of where I do all my work and get out to places like like Panels Coffee and Comic Bar here in uh, Oceanside or when I go to SoCal Comics down in San Diego, which will be there again on November 11th for a huge event. Um, or doing the conventions like Comic Fest or going out to Las Cruces or El Paso or Phoenix. And it's fun to meet new people. It's fun to see existing people that I've been communicating with online. And uh, I, I, love, I love to talk, man. I, I will talk forever and ever. Being a performer in music was good. Before that, um, I had training as a performer being a sentinel at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. And it's not about being performer, but it's the fact that you are doing something in front of a massive crowd day in and day out that you have to do perfectly. And so uh, you learn how to get up in front of people. You learn how to present yourself in front of people, how to speak, how to not shy away from things, and kind of... 
uh, how to meet people too. Um, I think one of the reasons why I do successful at uh, events is because I'm able to talk to people. I've been at shows where the people sitting next to me spend their entire time looking down at their smartphones or their iPads complaining about the show when I'm sitting there talking to people that are walking by and selling my books to them. You know? I think you were telling me about how I guess uh, you were at a convention one time and you made eye contact with somebody. Oh yeah, they were across the way at an artist alley and nobody was even acknowledging them. And I was standing up looking at them, waiting for them. When they looked over at me, I waved and said hi. They made a beeline over to my table and bought every one of my books specifically because I said hi to them. He's like, yeah, you said hi to us. I'm like, cool. <laughs> Sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes there's a little more work involved, but it's fun. I get to talk about the stories I've created. Uh, get to bring people into the Grunt 1B Comics universe. And, uh, so it's a lot of fun. Speaking of uh, that universe, where can, where can people find that universe? Um, I do a lot on... Instagram and Facebook, Grunt 1B Comics. Um, also, you can find my books at grunt1bcomics.etsy.com or at any of the local shows that I, that I attend. Well, thank you for your time, Chad. Oh, thank and, uh, you. I yeah, it, man. We look forward to uh, talking with you again. Awesome. Me too. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Hall H Show. We are with the uh, incomparable Mr. Matt. Uncle Dunphy Dunford. Oh, un incomparable. I've been called a lot of things. I mean, incompetent, incredulous, uncredible. But uh, yeah, this is a new one. So yeah, I'm happy to hear it. <laughs> so we are at the uh, panels, uh, comic book and coffee shop here in Oceanside, California for a little artist meet and greet. I just interviewed uh, the four artists and... Uh, I saw Matt at the, at the, out of the corner of my eye, and I said, I got to get him on, on this podcast, too. So uh, how, you do, how you doing? I'm doing okay, but it's like, I mean, it's so unusual for me to show up at a comic event. I mean, it's like, I mean, me going to an event with comic books, I mean, that's just like completely unheard of. I mean, why would I do that? So I know how rare it is for me to appear at such events like this, but I guess I'm happy to be here. And you know what? Panels here in Oceanside is a wonderful place, and... I came here about a month ago after uh, an event that I was uh, putting up called uh, Poke Oasis, which was a uh, you know fandom for Pokemon events and whatnot that's put on by Video Game Connection and the folks at Nerdbot. And I decided, you know what? It's been a long day. Let me uh, test the new guys. And I came here and I absolutely loved it. It really resonated with me because you've been hearing about all these like comic and coffee shops. They've got one in Arizona. They got one in New York. But it's like we don't have one yet. In the in the San Diego area, the closest one I could think of was you know there's one in the San Francisco area because every time I go to the Bay Area, it's like I literally will spend my vacation just comic shop, comic shop, comic shop, comic shop, comic shop, comic shop. But the fact that we finally have one that's you know within San Diego County now, I think is a great thing. And I came in, and the owner, uh, you know, Avros and Tio, like they're wonderful. And it's great what they're doing. And they're helping local creators. They're selling books to the big two. They're having community events here. Because every comic store should bring something different. And I don't play favorites with comic stores. I go to all of them. And I love just being part of them in any way I can. And so now with this store, here doing this with the comics and coffee, I think it's wonderful. What's your uh, favorite pastry? They also have pastries here. You know, they do have pastries here. And regrettably, I have to say that I have not tried them yet because I'm trying to stay away from carbs because fighting the dad bod, getting back in shape, fighting the dad bod so I can look like Rad God. Yeah. It's one of Chad Kavanaugh's ones if you haven't seen it yet. Well, if you ever decide to try one, the blueberry is pretty good. The blueberry okay. pie. I might try the blueberry. It's yeah. like uh, one of the things. Sorry, flex <laughs> on the camera for you. Uh, so what's, uh, what's new with you? I think the last time we had you on the show, it was our uh, San Diego Comic-Con recap. Oh, yeah, San Diego Comic-Con recap. Have you have you, can you believe it's already been three months since Comic-Con wrapped? Uh, but, you know, we do have a lot of other things in the work. I have been going around to a lot of conventions. Uh, let's see. Earlier today, I was down at the TS uh, Toy Show, so I picked up some toys there and spoke with uh, Aaron Sparrow, the writer of the Darkwing Duck comic, who is, you know, a really cool guy, and learning the fact of, like, he actually also wrote the uh, Darkwing Duck comic for Boom Studios, but didn't get proper credit, but now 
publications of it have been changed and he is getting proper credit on it so it's making amends for things and that was really cool to talk with him because I'm a huge Darkwing Duck fan I was recently at NerdBotCon which was a whole lot of fun where I did uh, seven Weird Al cosplays in one day so just variations on Weird Al so putting that into perspective that was you know really a whole lot of fun uh, the folks at NerdBot put on a fantastic con and they're going to be doing some more stuff along the way and Let's see, last night I also did the Little Fish cosplay figure drawing session where we had at least, I think we had 30 artists come out in force to draw our wonderful featured models of Miss Echo Blocker, who the guys could not take her, their eyes off her, and like, yeah, thanks for good reason. And also Mr. Sean Richter, who you introduced me to, was a featured model there busting out his Captain America and his Wolverine, and that was just wonderful. I ha And we had a blast. It was so many wonderful moments, bunch of wonderful art produced, and we're already looking forward to the next one, because like, you know, we just love cultivating the art community, the comic community, the cosplayers. Just take it all in and bring it all together. Um, can you briefly tell us about Little Fish? Comic Book Studios? Okay, so Little Fish Comic Book Studio, which is now in its fifth year, is San Diego's premier art education institute. So when you look at resources for getting into comic art, I mean, we have a lot of wonderful talent here, but if you ask them, where'd you get started? A lot of them say, well, I started kind of just tracing on my own, or I had to wait till I was like in college to go to art school. There's not really a good resource for that that's accessible. And so Alonso Nunez sought to himself create a place that is affordable and accessible for artists of any age. I mean, we have students as young as seven, and I think our oldest is 45, to just learn comics. So if you want to learn to draw superheroes, if you want to learn to draw anime, if you want to learn, like, you know, Sunday strips, web comics, Little Fish can teach you the fundamentals of all the cartooning and sequential art that you need. And we are located over by the SDSU area on... Uh, on Elkhorn Boulevard in the uh, not-so-sketchy area, so feel free to come by, check out our library. It's great for kids, great for adults. If you want to learn to make comics, we can hook you up. And uh, you're also part of the uh, San Diego Comic Fest. Ah, yes, San Diego Comic Fest, which is just concluded its fifth year and entering its sixth year. And so now we are six months away. It will be happening from April 20th through the 22nd in 2018, so it's a nice little three-day show. And it's going to be a whole lot of fun. This year we are showcasing 200 years of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, so we will have a wonderful uh, wonderful cast of characters. Uh, some of our special guests that we have on board, uh, we've got Steve Purcell, who's you know an art director at Pixar, and he was one of the fundamental guys founding of founding of the LucasArts video game division. He was responsible for doing Sam and Max and the Monkey Island franchises, and so he's going to be joining us. He's also one of the lead character artists on Brave, so if you're a fan of Brave, it's great to meet Steve Purcell. Uh, Boris Karloff's daughter, Sarah Karloff, is going to be swinging by to talk about her father and his experiences as Frankenstein, so we do have like some of that. And our special guest is going to be Miss Karen Berger, who is the former editor-in-chief of Vertigo, and, you know, helping to launched the British invasion of creators, bringing over guys like Neil Gaiman, Grant Morrison, Alan Moore, and helping fundamentally establish their careers while she was at DC Comics and eventually you know, transitioning to you know, leading Vertigo in the early 1990s. So yeah, Comic Fest is going to be a whole lot of fun, and uh, stay tuned. We'll have a couple more announcements to make. We'll be expanding onto other things besides the Frankenstein thing, but uh, yeah, we got a lot of good guests coming in, and we're just warming up. And where's it going to be held uh, in next year? It, uh, we will no longer be at the uh, Four Point Sheraton, but uh, this year we uh, will be back at the uh, Town and Country Hotel in the Mission Valley area. So you'll be uh, doing our thing there. We've been there before. It's a good spot for us. So we're looking forward to going back and you know just jumping around and having it because we know how to use that venue and play to our advantages. So we want to use it to make sure you have a good time. What are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? You know what? It's hard to say that I haven't been reading as much as I could be, but it's just what it's gotten to life because I go around and I work and I cultivate and I go to events and despite the amount of books that I am buying, I'm not reading as much as I could be. But uh, ones that I have read uh, as of late, uh, I read uh, Francesco Francovilla's uh, 
Black Beetle sequel that he did, which is actually a prequel, and I thought that was actually a phenomenal story, and it was really wonderfully done. I also uh, read Box Brown's uh, biography of Andre the Giant, and I thought that was a wonderful book as well. And otherwise, I've just been reading a lot of comic history and other stuff like that, and, you know, talks on, you know, uh, Comic-Con. You are the world's youngest comic book historian. Yeah, I mean, I am the world's youngest comic book historian, but, you know, I'm getting older now. I'm going to be 32 next month. I mean, so old. I mean, I can barely call myself that. I'm like... But yeah, it's just like, I really wish I could be reading as many comics as I could. But the truth is, I've just been too busy to read them. And I'm not going to be a fake or like lie about it and say, I'm reading this, I'm reading that. I mean, I will go in and I will buy them and I will support. But I, someday, I will tell myself, someday I won't be as busy as I have to be. And I'll be able to be the fan that I want to be. But until now, I have to be the responsible professional and seek to where the priorities go. And... I wish I could prioritize reading comic books and goofing off all day like I used to. I miss it. I honestly do. It's one of the things, but I've got a lot going on. Well, you do goof off every once in a while in your Facebook Live videos. You know, I do goof off every once in a while with, you know, the Uncle Dunphy Power Hour, which usually does not last about an hour or so. But, uh, you know, I think it's a fun way to goof off. You put a camera in front of me. You put me on stage. You put me in an audience, whatever. I'll annoy them and entertain them in any way I see fit. It's what I do. How many uh, fidget uh, fidget spinners do you have now? Well, you know, out of my 1,000, I've actually probably down to my my fourth one right now because I keep them still in the box still. I spin them and sometimes they fall and then I break them and then I can like, you know, take them and I can like make like brass knuckles out of my fidget spinners. I can fuse them together and make triple fidget spinners. But you find that when you fuse them together, it affects the spin ratio so they don't spin as well. So even the broken fidget spinners that I do have, I will repair them and keep them together because every fidget spinner counts in this world. So for our audience members that do not know the story behind your fidget spinners, do you want to sort of do a brief uh, recap of that? Well, so... For my day job, I work for a World War II historical society called World War Wings, where I'm a writer there writing about World War II history, military aviation, and just basically just like, you know, war history type stuff. And my boss thought it was a good idea to order 1,000 fidget spinners based with the design of the Corsair, which was a uh, naval uh, naval aviation plane used during World War II. And if you're a Star Wars fan, you know that the wings pulled up, and so that's what the TIE fighter is based on. And he thought, okay, we'll do it as the uh, based on the fidget spinner propeller. And I'm like, mm, fidget spinners are kind of like so three months ago. And he says, let's just do it anyway, because by then old people will be getting into them. And so like, I don't think old people like fidget spinners. I think they think they're the most toxic thing on earth. So he decides to order them anyway, but orders them from China. So anything you order from China will take two months to get here. So here we are half a year behind the fidget spinner trend. But like, you know, I'd never actually played with a fidget spinner in my life. So I'm like, okay, let me try it. And I'm like, and I realized this is the greatest thing in the world because all they do is annoy people. And if you give me something to annoy people, I will like, take it to no end and now I have like a thousand of them and it's like here I am behind the trend and like I mean the only thing more annoying than that would be like selfie sticks I mean who uses those who uses a selfie stick so uh, speaking of annoying like if people want to get annoyed online where can they find you if you want to get annoyed online, you can just find me at Facebook, uh, just Matt Dunford, M-A-T-T-D-U-N-F-O-R-D. You can also find me on Instagram. So if you want to see me just annoying the hell out of you, it's typically just selfies of me, my hair, different fashions and stuff that I do. And uh, Bowser, the fat dog at my office who lies around being sad all day because that's what bulldogs do. They're just sad and fat. But no Twitter. But no Twitter. I don't really do Twitter. My Twitter gets constantly hacked by porn bots. And honestly, like, Twitter's where you go to pretend to be important. I know I'm not important. I'm just a dork. <laughs> where can uh, people find you in the near future? What, what kind of other projects uh, you, are you working on? 
Well, I've got uh, one in the work called uh, Non-Disclosure Agreement, and then I will be involved in another uh, one called uh, Non-Disclosure Agreement. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can always find me at Little Fish Comic Book Studio, which is one of the things. And, of course, you can always find me at uh, San Diego Comic Fest. And um, you can also find me at certain events uh, coming up uh, during WonderCon called Can't Talk About It. And uh, that'll be Saturday night at 8 p.m., so I can't talk about it just yet. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, so it's like, you know, we got a, I got a couple of things in the work, so, but just, you know, can't talk about it yet. All right, well, when you are able to talk about it, let me know. Oh, trust me, I won't be able to shut up about it. <laughs> cool. Well, it's nice catching up with you, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Always a pleasure, man. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Holly Show. This is Aaron here, and I'm here uh, with uh, Andy Ducliff. Uh, we are at the uh, panel's comic book and uh, coffee shop here in Oceanside, California. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Good, good. Um, thanks for uh, coming on the show. Yeah, I, s- I saw you drawing uh, off to the side there, and I thought I'd uh, you know, ask you if you wanted to be on an interview, because we had met uh, previously before. I think it was uh, Free Comic Book Day. Yeah, Free Comic Book Day at yeah. Villainous Lair in San Diego. Yeah, right. So... Uh, how are you doing, and um, what brings you to panels? How am I doing? Eh. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm doing good. It's been... Uh, so what brings me to panels is my buddy Scott, part of the Accidental, accidental Aliens crew. He was, um, you know, I saw he was doing the show. I grew up here in Oceanside, so I figured, you know, support my friends, meet more creators, uh, go down memory lane. So... And plus, be productive. It's been a it's been a weird month, but <laughs> finally, kind of getting back into it, you know. <laughs> cool. uh, so uh, you mentioned Scott earlier, and you mentioned uh, accidental aliens. Um, can you describe, I guess, what you contributed to uh, accidental aliens? Yeah. So I contributed the short story "Fed Up," um, sort of in the middle of the book, if you have that. Um, and yeah, we mm-hmm. just got together. Um, Contribu- contributed six pages each. There wasn't any genre, and the whole point was just to just support local artists. Um, I met Scott and uh, some of the other crew as a, um, at San Diego Comic Fest back in 2016. So we just kind of started hanging out, and uh, Villainous Lair kind of became our hub. Um, and then uh, Free Comic Book Day 2016, Scott said like dude, we should totally do this, guys, and everyone was on board, so um, we had a year to complete six pages, um, and you could do whatever you want. If you wanted to write, draw it all, that's what I did. Cool. Um, Other people, they kind of collaborated, so like Travis and Emily, they, so Travis wrote his story and Emily illustrated, so you can do a wide variety of things. And how long did you guys plan on, um, how how long did it take to plan out Accidental Aliens? Uh, it wasn't, it didn't start out as a plan, I guess. It was just sort of like a spitballing ideas. And then just, we kind of came back to a few ideas and we just kind of started like condensing it more, just the more we like hung out and talked. Um, and then, so then, um, when Scott said, oh, we should do an anthology story to release for free comic book day. That's sort of when we sort of kind of made it more official and so then, and we got into it, like we designed a logo and mm. it's funny enough, like at first we wanted to call ourselves like Light Switch Studios because we were afraid like Accidental Aliens um, was already taken. Mm-hmm. And technically it is by like some really cheesy romance novel, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we figured like it's not quite in the same genre industry, I guess. So, um, and you know, I, I think it's a lot more fun. I've got my alien earrings. So, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. So yeah, that's kind of the how it kind of started. Just a spitballing, really. So speaking of how things got started, how did you get your start into comic books? How did I get my start? I'll let you know when it happens. But um, <laughs> nah. uh, I, I really got into like manga and anime when I was like ten. Um, like I saw my cousin drew this really awesome picture of like this ninja girl, and I just like I want to do that. And you know I had been into like art craft, arts and crafts, but not like to that level. And so, pretty much then on, like I was you know I participated in like anime club in high school and like various art classes. Um, and then you know college and your first job kind of happened, so I took a little brief hiatus when I was in my late teens. And then now, um, but I decided to get more serious into it uh, two years ago. 
And so now we, uh, you know, we got our Kickstarter and we published the mm -hmm. anthology. So that's my first published book. Okay. You know, even though I only Cong congratulations. Oh, thank you, thank you. So even though I have like, it's only six pages out of the various stories, it's still, it feels good just to know that like, okay, like, I, I set myself for a goal, even if it's small, but I did it. And you can too. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there, there's a, um, I, I came across a sort of quote the other day, and it went something like, uh, when you close the door to perfection, you open the door to progress. So you shouldn't like have to wait for that perfect moment because that may cripple you and from, you know, from like actually starting something. So it's good that you got that uh, first experience, you know, with the anthology out, at, you know, out there and now you can you know try to do something else yeah definitely so right now i'm working on the pages you saw me working on is uh, for next year's anthology and um i so i work for a local news station and that's where i got the idea for my next story how does how would local news cover the fall of society as we know it mm -hmm. and so it takes place in like this barren wasteland and you just kind of see this news crew like surviving mm -hmm. so I'm having a lot of fun with that idea. It's something I'd like to uh, kind of maybe turn into a series. Mm. Um, whereas like the last story was just kind of like a, a quick self-contained short story. So you're going to write and draw uh, again? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I might. So for this one, yeah, I, I'm writing and drawing everything. Um, if I do decide to continue it, I might get a writer. I like drawing, but um, I do want to kind of hone my writing skills as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I'm still kind of feeling things out. Um, you had mentioned that, uh, I guess, anime and manga was a big influence on you? Yeah. Uh, what's, uh, if you were to recommend three anime, what, what, what would it be? Um, I mean, these are like the more mainstream ones, like Naruto, Sailor Moon, Dragon Ball Z. But um, there have been some like more obscure, well, obscure to mainstream, er, to American audiences, I should say. Um, so I, I really love the book Uzumaki by Junji Ito, which is, and it's a very strange concept. It's about a village that's cursed by spiral themed, just disasters or, or tragedies. And it's very hard to explain because it's very, very surreal. Mm -hmm. But um, if you, if you love horror and you love anything that's bizarre and weird, I recommend Junji Ito. Um, and he was a heavily, he up heavily in influenced my art style. I can't talk, sorry. <laughs> my art style in my last short story. So that one's more manga-esque. This next one, I kind of want to be more like Image Comics, um, kind of emulating Saga a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Saga, I, I mean, what other comic books are you reading? Um, I'm reading Paper Girls. Um, Unstoppable Cherub by, by my friend Travis. <laughs> Give a shout out. Um, uh, what else? Well, this one isn't a comic per se. Uh, I'm reading Nosferatu by Joe Hill, who was uh, author, uh, the writer of Lock and Key. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, Lock and Key, Saga, Paper Girls, those are my main ones. That's an interesting mix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just kind of like, oh, this seems cool. And <laughs> so. so, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, <laughs> hopefully, with more books. Um, I don't know. That's like the one thing that I, I know I want to accomplish in mm -hmm. five years. Just like I want to um, have just more content that's published. Um, I, I have been working on and off on this like fantasy idea of like, you know, at its core, it's like it's a band of heroes fighting an evil. Mm -hmm. But um, just kind of in light of everything that's been going on in the world, I kind of want to focus more on like how can two or, or four people um, work together to solve a greater evil and work through their disagreements and different political and ethnic backgrounds and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's sort of an idea that I kind of want to launch in the next two years. It's still in the outlining stages, mm -hmm. but um, hopefully in five years I'll have some issues out by then. Cool. We look forward to that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess for people out there who are sort of in the same uh, boat as you are and trying to sort of launch their career... Um, what are some pieces of advice that you can sort of give to them? Um, so the biggest piece of advice I could give is just don't worry yourself sick. Mm -hmm. And it's good to have drive. It's good to have passion. But um, one of the mistakes that I made was I essentially just like paralyzed myself with worry. Like it's kind of like what you said earlier, that, that perfect moment that you're waiting for, mm -hmm. that's never going to come. If you're waiting for that perfect moment, then you're just going to be just constantly disappointed. Um, and so what's funny is like when I initially went to Comic Fest um, a little over a year ago, that was just sort of 
more on a whim. Um, like I had, it was like on Valentine's Day, and like I had a date fall through, and was like, okay, fine, I'll go to Comic Fest. And so, but I met these guys, and uh, we've been hanging out ever since. So I mean, I never would have guessed that this was how I would kind of, sort of, almost get my foot in the door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> at, le- at least in the independent scene I have. Um, but I'm here talking to you, and uh, we'll see how much farther I go. <laughs> <laughs> so besides the. Uh the next part of the Accidental Aliens anthology for 2018. Uh, what are what other projects are you working on? What other project, um, so I, I my uh, main project has been my my work. Um, I work for a local news station. Mm-hmm. So uh, so whenever I get a chance, I try to like pitch like local comic book stories to um, the news station I work for, ABC 10, San Diego. Uh, so it's just like the way things have worked out. Like my main focus has been on that. Um, the only main project I have is the anthology and my fantasy comic. Mm-hmm. But um, but we'll see. Like I, you know, one good thing about my job, I'm a I'm a camera woman basically, uh, is that I see a lot of things, good and bad, and um, it's just kind of helped me hone a perspective on life. As cheesy as that sounds, but um, it's given me a lot of a lot of ideas, and so. I might do like uh, a story about how my first year working in news kind of changed my perspective on things, mm-hmm. especially, you know, in San Diego where I grew up. So, so is, is uh, journalism something that you had wanted to get into uh, ever since you were younger? Not necessarily. Um, like, I, wa- I, I, I can't talk again, sorry. <laughs> I've always wanted to be an artist. Um, but uh, when I was in college, like... I got paranoid like I was never going to get a job unless I got a more practical degree. So I majored in video production and then through just doing a bunch of freelance jobs, I uh, kind of found my way into news. So my first job was as a video editor at KUSI News and then I've kind of worked my way up from there. Um, And what's funny to me is that uh, working in news and being a video editor has actually made me a better comic artist and writer because now I'm thinking more consciously about, you know, switching up the camera angle, um, condensing stories. Mm -hmm. And that's a big one, too, because, you know, you don't want like no one's going to read like a million pages if they can see the same story in six. So, you know, so that's how journalism has helped me in a way. (laughs) But um, we'll see. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny you mention that because one of our previous guests, his name is Stefan Frank. Mm-hmm. He's the uh, creator and writer of this comic book called Silver. It's a pretty much, if you can imagine, uh, uh, con artists trying to steal the treasure of vampires set in a noir setting. Oh. Uh, but basically, he comes from a cinematic background. He's a uh, he worked as a senior animator for uh, Iron Giant and some oh, other wow. some other. So he takes that uh, cinematic approach and he's trying to apply it to his uh, comic books. Mm-hmm. So it's funny that you mentioned that your experience as a photo or a video uh, videographer has given you a different perspective on how to sort of arrange your content for your comic books. So yeah, um, and that and that's one thing that you know in the short 24 years on this earth that I've lived you will find a lot of lessons in the most unexpected places so you know going back to anyone that's looking to get in just um, you know you don't need to be specifically uh, how you feel things should be Think there is no should things are or they're not mm-hmm. so whatever situation you find yourself in just kind of take those lessons and then maybe channel it towards your craft or whatever you want to do um so that's just one thing that i've learned just based on my uh my i guess my cross training if that makes sense or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it mm-hmm. from uh just photojournalism and drawing comics well i look forward to seeing what you put into the next uh accidental aliens anthology uh, where can people find you online so i have my my Instagram, uh, Andy the Duke. That's my Twitter handle as well. Um, and I also just started a Tumblr page. That's in the bio of my Instagram. Um, so it's Andy with an I. <laughs> and it's a play on my name. People ask me, you know, why I call myself that. Uh-huh. But yeah, my full name Andy Duke. So Andy the Duke, obviously. obviously. So. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so you can check me out there. Cool. Well, thank you for your time, and I look forward to uh, reconnecting with you in the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. Take care.
Thanks again for listening to this episode, and please make sure to check out our guests online, or better yet, in person. Did you know? Aside from iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn, The Hall H Show is also on Spotify, so there is no excuse to not be a subscriber to our show. In fact, do a Google search for The Voice of Independent Creators. Peace, cheers, and artists assemble. Assemble.